Good Friday, everyone. Welcome to the Blue Water Climate Control VolQuest.com podcast, the mailbag edition on this Friday with Jesse Simonton, Rob Lewis, and Austin Price. Brent Hubs, glad to have you along with us again uh, for all of your air conditioning and heating needs. Check out Blue Water Climate Control. You can see them online at BlueWaterClimateControl.com or you can visit them on Twitter at BlueH2O underscore climate. The Mailbag edition is what we're going to get to today, and we'll jump right into this thing and jump right into the questions here uh, as we get started. Some pretty interesting ones in this week's mailbag, um, and we'll start uh, with, uh, I guess it's Galilee who has a question. He said he's hoping that his question is not bypassed this week. Is there anything being done to clean all the areas that the players use when they are allowed to return to practice? Nothing should hinder that. Jesse, I think it's pretty obvious that, you know, everything that's being not used right now is going to go under, you know, going to go through a deep cleaning and all those things. Uh, but but this does bring up a question about the college scene, about all team sports in terms of a reopening process. How do you go about that? The concerns and issues that you have, it's being written about quite a bit nationally right now from in terms of how much would you test, how often would you test pro athletes? These are a, a litany of questions that will have to be answered um, and have to have a plan for, uh, as opposed to just saying, hey, it, it's back open for business. Yeah, I mean, this is you and I had a conversation about this uh, offline, you know, as, as we continue to make these discussions. I just think anybody kind of, you know, making a finite conclusion one way or another, whether, you know, they think the season's going to be canceled or they think that we're starting on time. Uh, we just don't know. And so these sorts of questions that Galilee raises is why we continue to live in the gray, AP. And, and you know, there is no finite answer right now as we sit here on April 10th. I mean, it, it's, it's the, this whole deal remains fluid. There is optimism that, you know, a season will be played in some format, but that doesn't mean the season, because of concerns like this, because of what happens if the virus comes back, because of concerns about player liability, um, you know, this is it's apples and oranges with folks talking about, you know, Major League Baseball and, 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 the, and even the NFL versus college athletics. These kids do not get paid. Mike Gundy said the quiet part out loud and, 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 and stuck his foot in his mouth for that. And then so how how much they have they clean these areas, the, the, the rate at which you may have to still quarantine people in the coming months. AP, these are questions we just kind of will continue to deal with on a daily basis and don't have any firm answers right now. That's right. I mean, you know, I think Hubs brought the, said, said the right phrase. Everything, everything, whether it's, you know, my kids' elementary school right up through, you know, the New York Giants practice facility is underwent a deep clean. And uh, I think whenever it does, you know, whenever, you know, things start to get back to normal, it, I, you know, uh, I get like the whole thought process of, you know, you know, we're going to jumpstart the economy, and this is sure not a political type thing. But I think anytime any of that stuff happens, it, there's going to be a kind of a, you know, you're, again, not jumping from the di- high dive into the deep end. You're going to go in at the steps and do things gradually. And so, um, in, in my opinion, you know, I think that's how you'll see it. I think you'll see the testing, you know, uh, be very, um, you know, uh, I think, you know, very consistent all, across the board when, when you know, Kids are allowed to come back to campus. They're allowed to go into practice facilities and all that stuff. Um, and then you'll just kind of see things, you know, lessen and lessen as uh, as the uh, environment uh, improves. Yep. And we'll just have to see. I think, Jesse, you said it best. It's fluid and it's the gray area. There's not everybody wants a black and white, but, you know, on any on any on anything. They want a black and white answer. And there's just no black and white answers uh, at this particular point. All right. Cajun three's got a question. Uh, he wants to know, Austin, is there a commit coming in the next couple of weeks? And also to both of you guys early, but do you see a top 10 finish even with this unusual recruiting cycle? Assuming Tennessee, we go say eight and four during the season. Now we, you know, who knows about that, but first of all, the, the first question, anything you think coming down the pike in the next couple of weeks, Austin? I don't think anything is set in stone in the next couple of weeks. I do think that there could be a kid or two pop up in the next couple of weeks. Um, there was one last week that was close and then, you know, kind of backed off of it and decided to, to take a slower approach. And so um, I, I do think that, you know, this time of year, especially with the kind of situation we're in, uh, you're seeing kids kind of sometimes, I won't say knee jerk, but, you know, kind of just, you know, going on an impulse decision and, 
you know, um, so I think any of that's possible, uh, but I don't, I don't see anything set in stone in the next couple of weeks as of now. Jesse, you wrote about uh, on Thursday, you wrote about Tennessee's positioning for strength in this 2021 class. I don't know about top 10 at this point in time. I think that's premature because who knows where rankings change. How are the, how are the you know, how's rivals going to do rankings without summer camps this summer and, and those types of things? Those are all questions that are still out there as well. But you, you believe that, that Tennessee's positioned themselves pretty solidly in, in assembling the class because of the work that they've done basically in their region and close by. Yeah, I mean, right now, Tennessee sits, you know, right inside the top 15 uh, in the rivals rankings. They, they finished seventh a year ago. Um, I, I would imagine ultimately, you know, based on the way the board looks right now and Tennessee's position with a number of targets that, you know, somewhere between that in, in seven to 12 range is probably uh, to be expected. And, and, you know, for Tennessee to then get higher than that, they're really going to have to, I think, uh, hit a clean sweep. But I, I, I think you have to like Tennessee's positioning, AP, as I wrote about this, this cycle in particular because uh, they have reopened this pipeline to North Carolina. And that was something that has not really existed the last few years around here, Kavaris Crouch notwithstanding. A year ago, they didn't sign a single player from North Carolina. Even the one um, year they signed and, Crouch, they only signed Tyus Fields with him. I mean, it's not like, yeah. you know, they got him and one kid. Yeah, and 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 then the, the unique deal, which I do not think is going to happen every year, and I think – and as I wrote, I mean, on Thursday, I think the, the, the COVID-19 shutdown has actually perhaps helped Tennessee in this regard. Tennessee, I think, has, has a real chance to make some noise in Alabama. That's not going to be the case every year. Uh, but they are kind of uniquely positioned with a couple top targets, Jeremiah Williams being, you know, 1A on that board. And can they beat out, you know, LSU for, for a Dylan Brooks? Auburn's still in the mix there, too. I, I think that's interesting. Malachi Bennett's in that in that uh state as well you already have jordan mosley who's, who's a blue chip wide receiver so th this is tennessee's in kind of an interesting spot right now but you're seeing more and more of these kids commit uh to these schools that are either their home state schools or, or very close by because i think the, the localizing of this 21 class is going to be the story of the day yeah i don't disagree with that it makes you know the most sense and austin you mentioned this i think on the podcast two or three weeks ago to keep an eye on the, the, the local, the end state, because how much would parents be interesting in, in, be interested in their kid being that far from home, given what's gone through right now? I think that was a point you made early on. I think we're seeing that come about, not just at Tennessee, but with some other places as well. Our burger wants to know, what do you anticipate will be the biggest strengths on both sides of the ball next season? Not the best position group, but the biggest strength. Run game, short passing game, deep passing game, run defense, coverage, blitz, whatever. Will Tennessee finally be pretty close to Alabama, Florida, Georgia in size and speed? Let's take the latter question. Uh, roster size-wise, do we? You, you feel like this roster is closer to, to those schools Tennessee's chasing when you talk about Alabama, Florida, and, and Georgia? I, I mean, I feel, like they're, I feel like they're getting there. I won't say that they're, quote, there, but I do think that the size, the, the mass of this roster – um, size at linebacker and those things feel like it's getting closer to what Pruitt and his staff want. Yeah, I mean, maybe. What, what, what I guess the big unknown here, though, is what happens when you basically have lost uh, what could be the bulk of your summer workout program. Uh, how much, you know, is player accountability happening across the country, um, which then you kind of then kind of I think lean towards, you know, Bama and Georgia have been recruiting just at a different level than Tennessee the last couple of years. Tennessee's getting uh, better. They recruited as well as, you know, Florida this past cycle. So um, I, maybe they're inching closer, but I would certainly not say they're pretty close or even there yet. Well, I wouldn't say that in talent, but my point is they don't have a two hundred outside of Jameer Johnson. They don't have a 265 pound guy playing tackle or a 275 pound guy playing offensive tackle. So just from a, a girth size standpoint, I think they're get that think that they're getting closer. All right, Austin, give me the best the best strength of this offense you think this fall. What's the strength? Is it going to be the run game? Is it going to be the play action game? What do you think is going to be the biggest strength of this offense this fall? I'm going to go run game. The offensive line, I think especially if Cade wins his appeal, uh 
from a physicality standpoint, will be the best Tennessee's had in quite a while. Um, you know, Eric Gray kind of came into his own those last couple of games. I think Ty Chandler is going to be better with Jay Graham at the helm. And listen, I, I, I David Johnson is one of uh, a truly good friend of mine. Um, I love David, but David, and I know he's still coaching receiver or running backs at Florida State, but he, at the end of the day, David Johnson fancies himself as a wide receivers coach, you know? So, I mean, like, you know, I, I think you actually have a running backs coach now coaching the running backs. And I think that helps not that I think David did a good job last year, uh, but I, I think that David could have equally had a, you know, his impact on the receivers last year could have been just as good. Um, so, you know, with, with the talent that Tennessee had at the whiteout spot. So, um, you know, I think having a running backs coach helps the running game uh, this fall. Jesse, what do you think the defense's best best position or best strength, biggest strength of this defense is going to be? Yeah, and I'm also I will just piggyback. I, I'm actually going to be the count. I, I think the, I think Jay has has the ability of raising the ceiling of this uh, group in the run game. I, I will be curious how much better they, their success rate was so bad a year ago. Um, that needs to be an area of improvement for this for this offense for the for it to make a jump. To me, it's the opposite though. Defensively, I think Tennessee it should be uh, when you're talking about the bulk of pretty much every single defensive lineman's back, and really you only lost Daniel Batuli. They should be a stout run defense, and I think that probably should be the strength. You know, there's some questions uh, at safety, um, and, and and obviously you know pass rusher. But I think, you know, Tennessee, as the season progressed, became better and better at run defense. They finished last year. I'm looking at it ninth, middle of the pack, but they only allowed three seven yards per carry, um, which was actually fourth in the conference. And so uh, I think that should be even better in 2020 with a unit that returns again, every single defensive lineman and a, and a toe toa that should be better as a sophomore. All right, let's go. Two questions here. I'm going to merge these together and throw them at you, Austin. How many kids from the state do you think Tennessee is going to sign in this class or might sign in this class? And what is Ritzy's timeline uh, from ba- that one of those from Bassmaster Vol? I'll go five to six um, in state, and then yeah, um, and then uh, Ritzy's timeline. I don't think he's going to do it. Anytime. I mean, I think probably, you know, late May, early June at the earliest for Javari. Yeah, I don't think he's in a rut. I mean, with everything going on, a guy of his stature and the options he has, given the way he's going through the process, I don't get a sense he's in a hurry. Do you? No, I don't. I mean, obviously, any, I mean, it's a recruiting thing. I mean, he, he may go all the way till December, and I don't think he's going to do that. But right. I don't, I don't and, and, and flip it the other way, I don't think he's doing something next week. I got you. All right, let's get, uh, uh, of a couple of basketball questions in here for you, Rob. Uh, any chance that Plavzic transfers? Uh, seems pretty obvious he won't factor in the rotation next season, considering we lose uh, one contributor and add five players better than him, unless we completely strike out in the 2021 class. How does he carve out a role on this team? Secondly, after Fulkerson, who leads the team in scoring next season? Uh, first on Plavzic, I mean, I'm not assuming he's not going to be in the rotation next year. And, and the way that, that he gets there is the way that, you know, John Fulkerson got to where he is after being in the program for four years, getting better every year. So I'm not, I'm not remotely close to writing Plavzic off. And I mean, after what he just went through, I mean, I, I have not heard any rumblings that he's going to transfer. That doesn't mean he's not, but certainly not anything that, that anybody's whispering in my ear. And I don't know how excited he would be about sitting out a year when he just had to sit out half this last one. Uh, next leading score in the team. I'll go Jaden Springer. Okay. For behind Fulkey. Yeah, I, I don't see anything. I don't see Euros doing anything. I'm not even sure where, I mean, unless he transferred down, I'm not sure what his even options would be given the fact that he's already transferred once from a, from a power five school. So I don't, I mean, I just don't see how people can watch what a guy like Fulkerson has turned himself into and, and think that kids don't, or, or Eve Ponds, you know, I mean, and think that kids can't get better in this program. It just that boggles my mind. Yeah, I'm with you. Let's go to I Heart Vols. If if there is college football this year, how do you think crowds will look? And do you think the university will relax any of their donation requirements for season tickets, parking, et cetera? In, in terms of the ticket thing, I think that that goes back to what we were talking about at the start of this podcast. I think there's, I think it's way too open right now, way too up in the air as to what this thing's going to look like in the fall. Tennessee's obviously already done something that they've never done before, and that is uh, they have a payment plan option for season ticket holders. 
Uh, throughout the last few years, you've been able to get season tickets without a donation, so that would not be anything new. Uh, they don't advertise those. That's something that comes about kind of late in the process. Uh, so I think that that will still be available. You know, as for crowds in, in terms of what they look like, I think I think it depends on what the next three, four months looks like. I mean, are we, you know, is everybody still completely social distancing? Are people at golf tournaments, you know, or is Major League Baseball playing uh, with some type of crowd? And, and is there a comfort level there? I, I just think that that is, um, I, I think the answer to that question is an unknown. And I think that's part of what conference commissioners and ADs are all trying to gather around what is this going to look like whenever it opens back up and, and what can it look like? I just think right now it's just too many unknowns. So let's go to uh, CD Vol. Do you believe a Tennessee coach has ever offered taking a local player due to pressure locally to do so? I would say, yeah. Yeah. I would say that's probably happened at some point. You know, I mean, that, I know. we know like, that's happened at some point in, in, in the history. I'm mean, not right. this staff, no, but I mean, in the history, yeah, there have been times where they were, you know, I mean, look at, you know, Cody Blank, <laughs> he got offered by Virginia Tech, and, you know, Tennessee got a little pressure to do it, and they offered him and took him. And I mean, you know, there's been a, you know, a handful of those guys over the years. Devin Young, perhaps. Yeah, I think there was I think there was some pressure there with some of those guys, but because other schools were going to take them. I mean, I don't know that there's been, you know, a, a you know, necessarily a donor making pressures or anything like that, but I, I think that the the fear of losing a guy and look, part of this the two guys you mentioned are post Randall Cobb, right? Yep. And that's one that Tennessee looked at and said, you know, they should have done something there. They tried to get in there too late. I, I think any time a local kid comes up and Tennessee's not necessarily pursuing there you hear randall cobb's name being thrown around you don't want the next randall cobb to to go about so at times there's probably that's probably happened i don't think that's out of the the realm of possibility all right bg daddy vol fan that's a good one there uh i don't know if i missed this but if campus isn't open back up this summer what does this do for zach evans can he register online and start classes with whatever school he decides to attend it's an interesting dynamic guys that is developed potentially developing there the thought process would be, hey, he just shows up somewhere this summer and goes to class. The reality now is he may just show up and open his laptop up to a University of Tennessee Zoom class or to a Ole Miss Zoom class, I guess. Or he may not go to school at all this summer and wait and start in August, right? Awesome. Yeah, you could do any of that. I mean, you know, I mean, if I was him, I would play the long game. I mean, what if you can't get together and work out with your teammates? What's what? Why, why does it behoove you to start an online class? I mean, you know, if you don't I, – my point is, if you don't really know what you're doing, why rush it? You know, because it's not like you're missing out on workout time. So, um, yeah, I would yeah, I would play the long game if I were Zach Evans. But, I, you know, I, I go back to me, this is Tennessee or Ole Miss uh, with the, you know, the outside shot that he pulls a rabbit out of his hat and just pulls a shocker with somebody out, out of left field. And he's Just, also the wild card here. The wild card there is that even though behind the scenes the intel says it's not going to happen publicly, Evans is still suggesting he's going to take some Florida trip when all this is over. Now, again, I'm very skeptical that happens because that's not what you're hearing behind the scenes. But those are that's kind of the dichotomy that you deal with in recruiting: what you know is out there publicly versus what's you know not. Yeah, and it's. Um... I, you know, I don't see any way he takes a visit at this at this point in, in time. And, I, I, you know, does somebody just say, hey, you know, somebody close to him say, hey, you need to make a decision and get on with it. Maybe. I don't know. I think the other part of this that Zach Evans is involved in is the same spot that so many of these transfers are involved in. What are those guys going to do? What are the transfers going to do that don't have a home that wanted to take some visits? Chase Hayden, we've talked about Austin, other guys out there really hand tied right now in, in terms of what they're looking at. I, I think that those guys are going to be in some really unique spots and, and have some real unique challenges about them and trying to find their new uh, future home, wh whenever that may be. And, and if you're a school, do you take a transfer? You know, well, a guy you I, don't know very well. Ten Tennessee's over. They got to get rid of a couple guys. Yeah. Yeah. Numbers so, I mean, wise, like, they're pushing. Can, they're, can, yeah. You know, do, do you want to be the bad? I mean, think about the bad PR that comes along with, you know, if a kid decides to cause a stink because you get rid of him, you know, 
because you're over. I mean, like yeah, that to me, like. And I know you pointed this out last week, AP. That I mean, that's one of the big negatives for missing spring practice because I mean, some of that stuff could have been apparent to kids. Yes. They, you know, ended ended the Orange and White game playing in the fourth quarter with a bunch of walk ons Yeah, no doubt. And I mean, like, let's face it. Any other year that goes on, it's n- it's not a deal at all. But because of what's going on right now, with you know everybody kind of being just in in in, in limbo. I mean, I, I think you could potentially have to take a, a, a bad PR hit if, if a kid wanted to, to make a big deal out of the fact that you're telling him to go look for a, you know, a new football home and, and, you know, the kid can't really go look because of the situation that we're all in. Yeah, I agree with you. All right, Stock 100's got four questions here. Actually, he's got three, so we're going to hit those right quick. Uh, one for me, will the two orange stripes return on the white pants and the white stripes return on the orange pants for football? Uh, the answer to that is yes, that is going to take place uh, unless something changes. That is in the works for this fall that there will be two orange stripes. Rob, I know you're a big uniform guy, so this he wants to ask this to you. Will the Vols' road orange basketball match the wonderful home whites as they have two different uniform concepts for the 19 and 20 season? The white home that they have used the past couple years looks good. I think a matching road uniform would be really sweet. I, I didn't know that the road and the homes didn't weren't the same concept. You, I, I did. I did not was not aware of that either. I'll I, ask somebody. It's, I kind of thought that was. Good. I wanted to ask that question because I figured you, being the fashion maven you are, had no idea that there was something that didn't exactly match the home uniform no, with the away uniform. I, I will ask somebody and get an answer for that. All right, and, and a better question he has, Rob: Would Tennessee have a Final Four banner hanging in the arena if Bruce Pearl had not had to barbecue, lied to the NCAA, and remained the Tennessee's basketball coach? And I mean, it's that's a, impossible to, to give any, you know, give anything for certain. But I mean, I kind of think so. I mean, you look what he's done at Auburn, and and what I would say is a much tougher job than, than Tennessee when you talk about tradition, resources, facilities. So. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I would lean towards probably, you know, at some point in the last 10 years, yeah, he might, he might, he might have snuck in there. I think Tennessee would have got, had a ban, banner hanging in the uh, in TBA had Chris Lofton redshirted his senior year like Bruce Pearl tried to get him to do instead of continuing to play on battling say, cancer. That, that's, a, that's a great one, too. Wow, that is, a, that is a great point, AP. All right, um, I'm full of appreciate the appreciate the shout out stock. Oh, sorry. I got to go back to that one. Jess. I didn't want you to feel left out. Jesse, I think you bring so much to this site (laughs) and I hope you get more of a kick out of the fans that get upset with you versus Uh. you getting upset yourself. Sorry, I didn't. I didn't read the whole. You're right. Well, you're well, you're right. Bad. That wasn't. That wasn't a question. So it wasn't a question. It was I don't want you to feel. Statement. I don't want to want you to feel left out with the hallmark moment there. So, so, uh, so let's 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 that. review this guy that you just read. The I'm not even gonna reference his name because he doesn't worth it. Was isn't worth it for me. Asked you a question. Asked wrong 100. two questions. Gave Jesse, uh, you know, a, a great big pat on the back and didn't even mention me. So, uh, but you gave the best point in all the questions answered. Well, so well, of there course, you go. That's, I mean, that's what I do. <laughs> All right, strength coach AJ still the leader in the clubhouse. Yes, it's going to be AJ. I mean, I, you know, I don't see any way it's not AJ Artis as the new strength and conditioning coach. Uh, probably uh, in the next week or two, I would venture to say. All right, Vol Farm D. Why has Pruitt struggled to land an elite cornerback at corner at Tennessee? Do you think you, that Tennessee signs at least one of Tony Grimes, Nylon Green, or Isaiah Johnson? Well, I think uh, I, I think Grimes. They're I mean, just staying in that one right now is really hard. Green, they're going to have to beat out Georgia, I think, Austin. What about Isaiah Johnson? Well, Isaiah Johnson's somebody that Tennessee trended with early in the process, but you, you don't hear him, you know, don't hear him talk too much. There was some notion that he was going to transfer high schools. I'm not sure if that's actually happened or, or what. Uh, you're right. I think, you know, Georgia's, you know, probably going to be the prevailing thought for Nyland Green, especially with the fact that his mom's helping run that show and, it's not, but, you know, a stone's throw from Athens from where he's at. Um, and then you're right. Tennessee, you know, think about it. Six months ago was not even really in the Tony Graham sweet stakes and has, has kind of clawed their way back in it with, with Jeremy Pruitt, Derek Hansley, um, and, and others. Um, so I, I think Tennessee is, is, you know, just finding a way to stay alive and that one's going to go a long way to them being there in the end. All right, this, we'll throw this one Jesse and Rob's way. Is it possible that the chaotic environment surrounding – Collegiate sports right now actually benefits Tennessee in football compared to the teams they play. For better or worse, Tennessee returns its starting quarterback, something that's not happening at Oklahoma, Alabama, Georgia, and Missouri. 
Benefit Tennessee, no benefit Tennessee, Jesse. I, I mean, I think, I think, I think it does give Tennessee a slight benefit, not necessarily just for JG, but I think for the overall continuity of the fact that you have your same two coordinators, year two in Cheney's system, uh, and you're returning, you know, a bulk of your team uh, that rolled off, you know, six straight wins to end the season. Now, I still think Tennessee's behind three of those teams. Uh, that is when, that is mentioned Oklahoma, Alabama, and Georgia. Um, they I think that they, they they should beat the tar out of Missouri. Uh, I think I don't think the Tigers are going to be very good in 2020. Um, so, but I do think overall it, it, it it's it's an advantage. And you know, should the season start on time? All right, Rob, to you for question three. We've seen flashes of really great arm talent by JG, but only to be followed up with head scratching, head scratching decision making or start a game decision making, as Austin pointed out in Wednesday's podcast. Is it remotely possible year two in the same system produces an improved year from him, uh, much like everybody thought last year would be? Is there a chance that he can prove really improve, or do you think I'll he kind of is what he is? I mean, I, I'll, I'll be surprised if he doesn't improve from the decision-making standpoint. Now, some of that you can argue is just a feel for the position, not being able to see the field. But, you know, I I just think, you know, guys get better, even if they're this far along in their career. And I've, I've always been one, and I know you have too, that have, you know, lamented the fact that Jared has never been in the same offensive system two years in a row. So, yeah, I, mean, I don't think it's unreasonable at all to think that he'll be better. Will he be an all-SEC player? I don't think so. But I think some of the head-scratching plays will, will go down. I want to go with – I'm going to go with 100% yes on this. And, and I think a lot of it goes back to looking at a guy like Jonathan Crompton, who in 2008 was terrible. And then in 2009 had a really good year under Lane. And I, and I know that's switching coordinators from one year to the next. But I also think that Jarrett's taken a lot of positivity out of the fact that Jim Chaney is back and he's got a guy with the same, uh, you know, the same input two years in a row. Um, I think that, you know, again, I don't – do I think he's going to be all SEC? No. But do I think he can be better and avoid some of those catastrophic mistakes uh, or or potential mistakes that he had last year? 100% yes. The crazy thing on this – the crazy thing about this question or hypothetical is that Jared could actually be better, and I do think that if he is better, his turnovers will come down. Um but his production the other way might actually be mitigated by the fact that he may not have as much help at receiver, you know, so he could improve. But if the guys around him aren't as good, if there's not the NFL caliber of, of a Jawan Jennings or, you know, even a fringe guy uh, like Mark West Callaway, I think that could end up, you know, actually hampering Jarrett when perhaps he has made a leap that it just, you know, may not translate on the, uh, on the stat sheet. Yeah, it's a good point on the receivers because he's going to have to have some help there. Smokey Govals tried to ask this in the chat on Monday, but it got missed. Is DB Jamari Soul from MJ, I guess that's Mount Juliet, an under-the-radar guy that this staff could look at similar to Brian Aiken in the 19 class, or is he probably fit for a lower level? Austin, that's not an in-state guy I hear a whole lot about in, in terms of, of Soul. You? No, probably as of right now, I would classify him in the same – the same vein as Aiken, the guy that, you know, is a walk on. Right. And I think the one thing with a guy like soul, he probably needed summer camps and an opportunity to go show himself at some summer camps, probably not going to get that opportunity with the way everything stands right now. Uh, Pine mountain Vol, who leads this team in, t- in touchdowns this year. You can only pick one player. Who's the team leading touchdown. I'm going to say Gray. Eric gray. All right. Jesse and I are on the Eric gray train. Anybody else jumping on a different one? No. Rob. No, I'm good with that. Everybody's going to go with Eric Gray. So we got a unanimous Eric Gray out of that. Uh, Daglio7, who do you believe is the number one quarterback on Tennessee's board for 21? With all the apparent inroads with quarterbacks in 22, who do you think their number one choice is in 22? How many defensive linemen do you think the Vols try to get in 21? Let's start with quarterbacks in a 21 class. Anybody know what this board looks like? Yeah, Caden Salter. Yeah, it seems like they're down to Caden Salter. Yeah, Caden Salter, that's a Baylor, Tennessee – and Auburn battle, Baylor. Granted, they're the home ta- they're the home state school. If Matt Rule was still there, was still there, this is a slam dunk for the Bears. He's not, thus it's not. Um, parents really liked his visit. I think getting him in on that visit right at the gun before all the dead period started was huge for Tennessee. Much like I think the Hudson Wolf's visit was a big uh, 
momentum killer for a couple of teams like Ohio State and others uh, in Hudson's recruitment. I think Caden uh, liked the visit to Tennessee a good deal. As far as 22, I'm going to ride Ty Simpson and keep riding Ty Simpson. I think that he's the guy. And interesting question on the 21 defensive line class. Just, hey, let's know how big the number is. And I've always said, you know, you never turn down defensive linemen. You always take defensive linemen. You always take defensive linemen. But the game's different now. You know, you need more DBs because you're playing five and six DBs and a lot of times playing less defensive linemen. Um, do, do you hold, do you think Jesse recruiting classes and coaches hold to a stricter number on defensive linemen these days than they would have five or six years ago when the game was different? Yeah, I do think that Tennessee is going to, I mean, you, that, you make a good point, but I do think Tennessee is prioritizing uh, some beef on the defense in this class because of the sheer numbers that they're losing off this roster. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, you've also moved some guys like a Kingston Harris to offensive line. Uh, so I, 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 I think they're going to load up here, even though you're, you're correct that corners and kind of, you know, these hybrid athletic outside linebackers have become kind of a big part of the game. You, you still need to be able to have eight to eight to nine guys that you kind of trust in a rotation uh, up front, especially because Tennessee plays, you know, more four, four down linemen, I think, than people think. Yeah. Vol in uh, Louisiana, we know that we know what JG brings to the table after four years. What chance percentage wise do you give a uh, Bailey st- being uh, starting after a few games played this year? What are the chances of him being a starter this season? You know, I think the question here, Rob and, and Austin, everybody can jump in as well. How much does not having spring practice and not being around the team and working out and visiting with the coaches face to face set freshmen back from in terms of their impact and being ready to play? I, I think it's got to work against Harrison Bailey and that factor. It's not his fault, but I think it's got to work against him. I think it's huge, a, a huge negative for any freshman quarterback. I mean, the quarterback in particular, as opposed to other positions. Yeah, I think it's easier at other positions. One, two. Um, you know, as, as Coach Fulmer pointed out when he joined us on the nation the other night, you know, wasn't many years ago that, you know, and I know it's more than a decade ago, but that's not still not that long ago. They, you know, guys didn't arrive till August, you know. So, I mean, like, you know, I think some of these, you know, non-quarterback type players can, can find their way to the field quicker. I think it all depends on Jarrett. If, if Jarrett is making the same mistakes that he made this past year, Tennessee's going to give other guys a look. If he's not – it's his job, and that's just my opinion. Yeah, I don't disagree with that. Now, I, when, and, and go ahead, Jesse. I was going to say, just to, just to Fulmer's comments, you know, I, I do think there has to be kind of an open an openness. Again, something we talked about earlier in, in this mailbag edition that, you know, we're living in the gray area, and folks are going to have to adapt and change. So if they say the best thing that we can do is guys show up August 1, and then they're still trying to start the season by early September – um, then everybody's going to be on an even playing field. Having said that, I do think that the, the old nostalgia that, well, we just got here on August 1 and then did two-a-days for three weeks and we were fine. The game's totally different now. And, you know, it's just there will be – again, this is not independent of Tennessee. This is going to impact every school across the country. Uh, there will be repercussions because of that. Well, and I will say this, Jamal Lewis didn't get here to August, and he didn't know the pass protection well enough to play against Florida. As Mark Levine, baby, Mark Levine. <laughs> so it wasn't like they took their most talented guys in, who arrived in August 1 and said, hey, let's go play. So there is a, there is a mental effect or a mental side to learning this um, it is absolutely the case. Last two questions, we're out the door. Uh, if the Vols get a commitment from Tyon Evans, is Cody Brown still a take? And would the decision of Zach Evans have an effect on either one of those guys, Austin? I will go no on the second question. Um, no on the second, meaning Zach Evans coming no. to Tennessee doesn't affect their running back board and recruiting? I don't think so. I don't, okay. I, I don't think it affects their and, – and I, I do think it's first in wins. If Between Evans, Evans and Brown. Cody Brown's out. If Cody Brown jumps in, Tyon Evans is out. I mean, I just I mean to me, uh, Tennessee's going to take a, a bigger back or a, or more or more of a bruiser. You know, Cody's not a big back; he just it, it runs that way. So, it's, you know, Evans the same way, big. You know, he's, he's more like a bowling ball. So, um, you know, I think that that whoever jumps in would would get that spot. All right, last question. Now, now I'll say this. I mean, hold on one second. Uh, I'll say this. 
if LJ Johnson wanted to come, he would trump any of them at any point in the process. Here would uh, here would be my question: If Evan shows up, if Zach Evan shows up on campus here uh, in August, how much does that affect a guy like Cody Brown and some of these other guys and their viewing of Tennessee? Are they less? Are they more hesitant about Tennessee because the depth chart looks different if a five star running back shows up here in August? Yeah, I mean it, that could that that definitely could have an impact, but I don't think it affects Tennessee's view of their running back board if they land Zach Evans. They're still going to take two. All right, last question. Does, but, uh, your go point, ahead. Your 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 point, your point hubs is is well founded though, and that's probably in terms of you know we talked about the the positives. I think Tennessee has been able to take advantage through this shutdown. The flip side of that is again, may have a roster that's a little bit uh, a little bit fat in some areas, and you may have a running back room that hey, no spring practice. Fall camp may be shortened, or we don't know when our guys are getting together. T. Hodge and Lenneth Whitehead uh, are going to come here, you know, with the full expectation of playing running back. Yeah, and pretty so, deep. Pretty yeah, deep. That, that, pretty deep room. That's a, that's a deep room. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of cer- bodies there. Certainly. As last question, uh, does Pennington have a relationship with any of the current players or signings from Memphis? If so, what kind of impact could that have? He has a. He has a. He he, he has a relationship with. Uh, the guys in this previous class, um, and then has a, a really good relationship with Dallin Hayden. Okay, so there you go. Two guys that uh, have a big uh, potential impact with Dietrich Pennington. That's gonna, uh, that is the, the bulk of the questions in the mailbag. We appreciate everybody jumping into that. I want to remind you about our friends at Blue Water Climate Control. They offer that ductless air conditioning system as a smart alternative to central forced air systems known as a mini split heat pump. These ductless systems offer high efficiency energy savings, lower noise, personalized comfort, and advanced air filtration. They're an excellent option for remodels, room additions, finished basements, and more. For more information and to find out more about that and get a free consultation, contact Blue Water Climate Control. You can visit them at Blue Water Climate Control. You can visit them on Twitter at Blue H2O underscore climate, or you can give them a call at 865 299 22 Nine zero. Don't forget on Monday we'll have the Rocky Top Rewind. Going to look at the 1997 uh, SEC Championship game with Auburn, and then we'll jump back into our season review as well. Plenty of recruiting content on the site. We'll continue with that uh, throughout the weekend and early next week, and also have uh, a little update on some signees as well. But uh, we appreciate all the questions, and uh, that's going to do it for this mailbag edition of the Blue Water Climate Control of AllQuest.com podcast. For Jesse Simonton, Rob Lewis, and Austin Price, I'm Brent Hubs. Thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend, everybody.